Welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Virginia Virtual Farm to Table program. My name is Lena Wen and I am the 4-H Extension Agent for Fauquier County. The purpose of the Virtual Farm to Table program is to highlight Virginia grown produce and livestock that are raised on farms across the Commonwealth and demonstrate how to create a delicious and nutritious meal with a highlighted ingredient. This educational program will highlight Virginia agriculture, community nutrition, and farm to table connections and is brought to you by Virginia Cooperative Extension. VCE is an educational outreach program of Virginia's land grant universities, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. VCE's educational programs are delivered through a network of faculty at these two universities, 108 county and city offices, 11 agricultural research and extension centers, and six 4-H educational centers. I encourage all of you to participate in your local VCE programs to learn more if you have not already. So today we are going to be focusing on shiitake mushrooms and Adam Downing, forestry extension agent for the Northern District, will first show us how shiitake mushrooms are grown. Then Tiffany Patrick, who is our summer intern and she has a culinary degree from the Art Institute of Tampa. She'll teach us how to make garlicky shiitake mushrooms. And finally, I will share some tips for cooking with kids and getting them to eat mushrooms. Um, Katie Strong is the Family and Consumer Sciences Extension Agent from Fairfax County and she's our Q&A monitor for today. So if you have any questions that you would like the presenters to answer, you can type them into the Q&A box and we will try to address as many of those as possible. Note there is also a chat box, but that may not be monitored, so please make sure that any questions go into the Q&A box if you'd like those to be answered. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Adam. Happy to be with you all. Thank you for joining this Farm to Table. I don't get to uh, participate in a lot of uh, farm food kind of stuff because I'm a forester, and there's not a whole lot that ends up in the grocery store or on a, on a table that, that starts in a forest. There are maybe more than we might think about, but uh, this is certainly one. And so my little subtitle to this part of it is where yum meets fun. And these are a couple of my daughters uh, many years ago now. They are, are quite a bit older, but a couple of logs we had leaning up in a tree in the backwoods a number of years ago here in Madison, where I'm coming from, with a very nice flush of shiitake mushrooms to enjoy. The section that I'm going to cover here is going to have just a few slides and then we have a video. And on these slides, there'll be one slide for each of these topics. We'll go over a little bit of history, biology, value, and, and about growing them. And then the video will go through the process, okay? She is for tree. That's what that word means in uh, J Japanese. And taki is for mushroom. So this is a tree mushroom. It grows on wood. And the cultivated uh, varieties that are cultivated in mass quantities, that's grown on sawdust substrate for the most part. But what we're going to be talking about is on wood. And, and many people would say that when it's grown on wood, it actually is a more meaty consistency texture. So they're both good. But where does this thing come from originally? Well, it's originally an, and, and still native to the warm and moist parts of Southeast Asia. Talk about the first book on cultivating shiitake mushrooms, 1796. I can scarcely imagine a book that long ago on cultivating anything, let alone this. But uh, so this has been a, a well-loved uh, food for a long, long, long time. Um, it is cultivated worldwide now, uh, but not until 1972 in this country when a ban was lifted by the USDA that allowed shiitake uh, cut cultures to come in. And on a side note, it's good that there are strict bans on these sort of things so it doesn't become a problem uh, with uh, like invasive species and stuff like that. 83% of uh, shiitakes today worldwide are grown in Japan, but there's a lot uh, that are grown here as well. So this is not a plant, whereas uh, you know other farm to table things are either gonna be a plant or meat. This is in the fungi kingdom, its own kingdom. And so that means it does not photosynthesize. How does it get its food? Plants will uh, photosynthesize to, to make food out of the energy in, in the sunlight and carbon dioxide. But when it comes to fungi, they, they uh, put out digestive enzymes and then dissolve molecules that are absorbed. And, and that's where they get their food and then how they grow. And so there's chitin in the cell walls of fungi, and which is the same stuff you may remember from biology many years ago in high school. Uh, dissecting arthropods and their exoskeleton and hearing that word chitin 
which looks like chitin, but it's chitin. And uh, so how does a, a mushroom spread? It spreads by growth primarily and spores to a certain extent. So we think about spores, especially if you didn't know anything about a puffball mushroom, when, you, when it's dry and you step on it, a lot of spores go out and actually need to be careful not to breathe those in. So spores can theoretically uh, get more mushrooms going, but um, most of the time in nature, mushrooms spread simply by growth. So let's talk a little bit about value and, and please take all this with a grain of salt, okay? But I do know that when I've been in a grocery store and seen shiitake mushrooms for sale, they are the most expensive mushrooms in the store. So $16 a pound is what Tiffany just paid for the mushrooms that she bought to uh, do this uh, demo. But we've got a, gen, uh, a growing enterprise that uh, University of Maryland did, and there's, there's a lot of other ones out there. But in terms of, you know, what could this possibly bring in and, uh, as a larger enterprise, not just your backyard for fun? So if you had a thousand logs and you were assuming a kind of a wholesale price of 350 a pound, which I think is actually on the low end from some other stuff I read, there's your numbers. So you could, you know, expect to make a few thousand dollars on average, a couple thousand dollars on average a year. And these costs include a, the calculations in this, these set of numbers include a lot of cost, things that you may not have to invest in. For example, if you're charging, you know, hiring labor, or if you're not counting your own time uh, and buying logs, if you can get logs for free. So anyway, just to throw that out there, there's a lot of good information and, and uh, there'll be some information put into the chat with some links to that publication that I just mentioned as well as some others. Uh, the farmer's market uh, and direct marketing is uh, another good opportunity if you were to get into this more than just uh, for your own fun. And there uh, looks like $16 or, or more a pound, I would say. And then a uh, nice thing about mushrooms one of the nice things is that um, these dehydrate very easily and very well. And so if you can't sell everything that you have as a fresh product, you can certainly dehydrate it and package it up and uh, figure up a price based on what I have here, which is one pound of fresh mushrooms will end up being about two ounces of dried, and they will maintain for a long time. I have a little diagram here over here on the slide showing different ways to stack a larger quantity of mushroom logs. So in the video, I just have them leaned up against a tree. But if you were doing a larger quantity, then you would definitely want to come up with a way to um, be efficient in your space usage. The X pattern is probably the most common. Uh, you don't have to dig down through a pile to get to those, which is nice, versus the crisscross method, which you would have to remove some of those logs. But uh, when you get into that level of things, then you're talking about soaking logs and forcing the bloom. So it's, it's a whole other thing. What we're really talking about here for the most part today is kind of the backyard hobbyist. So here are some of the resources I've already alluded to. The one from Maryland, which had that budget. There's a longer publication from Cornell, much more involved. Uh, USDA has a great mushrooms portal, and I gotta give a shout out to Janelle. She was the one who was gonna be uh, with me on this, but she is uh, unable to be with us today. So Janelle, if you're watching, thanks for helping uh, find that resource. And then we've got a great resource at Virginia Tech called Forest Farming. And there's a lot of things there for you to look at if you want to and what you can grow in the woods, shiitake being one, ginseng and so on, many other opportunities there. And with that, we're going to uh, watch a video. This was recorded a couple months ago. You'll see the date on the video of the process. Go ahead with that. That's great. We're going to start out with talking about the logs themselves. Here we have a, a, a about 38 logs that uh, we harvested about a month ago. Um, these are mostly white oak logs. They work well for the strain of mushrooms, sh the strain of shiitake mushrooms that we're inoculating with. And uh, we cut these logs out of a, a forest, like I said, about a month ago, and then just put them in a dark, cool place to let them sit. The time of year that you harvest these logs is important in that you want the bark to be tight. Because once you start handling logs in the springtime, then the bark just comes off very easily. In fact, you may have noticed, or perhaps you can take notice, of uh, log trucks going down the road this time of year, and some of the logs are completely naked. They don't have their bark on at all, and that's because the spring sap flow makes the bark very loose and comes off real easily. So we harvested these while the, log, the trees are still dormant. The leaves, the buds hadn't started coming out yet at all. Here another uh, couple weeks, the leaves on the white oak trees will be out, 
and perhaps fully formed in much of the state and the bark will be tight again. So you could be harvesting uh, white oak logs um, again uh, by the time this video plays uh, for shiitake mushrooms. And if you do that, then you want to uh, store those logs for a few weeks because during the growing season especially, they've got antimicrobial uh, or fungal act, um, activity in there that you want to kind of die down so that when you inoculate it with the fungus that you want, in this case shiitake, they'll be able to take it. So I'm um, going to introduce you to uh, the first friend I have here with me, and his name is Charlie Becker. Charlie is with the Virginia Department of Forestry. He's a marketing and utilization specialist, and he's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about the log that he has here and what we're going to do as the first step in inoculating this, uh, getting it ready for shiitake log. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, what we have here, of course, what he mentioned is a white oak log. Uh, the ideal size that we try to get is three and a half to four feet long, so it's fairly easy to handle, and usually somewhere anywhere between about three and six inches, seven inches in diameter. And what we tend to do, and we'll drill the holes here, is we try to get the holes spaced roughly about six inches apart, and then we rotate it and go down about two inches and split the difference so we get a diamond pattern in the log when we're done. And this helps make sure that the, log, the spawn will run through the log as quickly as possible because the mushrooms don't come out until after the log has been totally filled with the, um, the fungus. All right, great. So uh, uh, Charlie's going to be using a special drill. This is actually an angle iron. I said that once before. The mistake, excuse me, this is an angle grinder and it has a special bit on it that's uh, set to go a certain depth and it's very fast speed with, on this machine. So you'll get to watch these chips fly here. All right, Charlie, we're ready. Okay. These alternating holes, a couple inches apart this way, six inches apart this way. It does not have to be exact. The idea is just to get this uh, the spawn put in all the way around the log in enough uh, frequency that it can kind of occupy that log. So another way that you can drill the holes is just with a simple drill, either you know a battery powered drill or um, or uh, one that's plugged into an outlet with the same bit, or you can use a regular bit and just put a marker on that. Of course, is going to be more work. But this is just slower than with the uh, angle grind um, than with the uh, angle grinder. But it would be the same same deal. And if you're just doing enough logs for yourself, then that may be perfectly acceptable. Once those holes are all drilled, then we're going to use the inoculator. This is a thumb action inoculator. There are some also with a bigger palm that you would pat like that. You can do that with this, but your palm is going to get tired. And the size of this is such that it matches this bit, okay, with depth and with diameter, which makes it very handy. You could, of course, do this without the special tools. This just makes it a lot easier and a lot faster. So you see this uh, plunger that uh, comes out will push out the, the plug. So I've got the, uh, the spawn here, which um, the spawn is um, is a lot of sawdust actually. Uh, you can see a lump here that I'm breaking up and this little white stuff that is the mycelium um, of the fungus of this particular strain of shiitake mushroom which this is WW70. Okay, And uh, so here's a nice big chunk of the strain. So anyway this is all uh, just kind of mixed together with sawdust as the uh, carrier or the matrix and this uh, plunger then you would jab it in here. You might want to put this into a plastic container instead of this bag so you don't punch holes in it. This bag is about three pounds and it will um, fill up 20 or so logs. So you just put that in the hole and put, push it in there. I'll show you a close-up of this here in a minute. I'll just go ahead and do these holes. Sometimes they need a little extra push than what uh, your thumb may do, but everything's working nice and most often it does then you just line it up give it a push with the thumb and you can see that that is nice and full you don't want it all the way flush you don't want it sticking up because at this at the next stage when we're waxing it we want that wax to sit down in there so we've got three, four holes here done uh, pretty quick with just a simple drill 
Uh, this tool, I can't remember how much this costs, but you can buy these from suppliers. Um, and of course, if you wanted to, you could simply take your finger and kind of push it in there. So if you just wanted to do a few logs uh, and see what it's like, you could, uh, you could go about it that way. All right, so um, next is uh, waxing. We'll take a look at that, and then we're going to head to the woods. Okay, so after we have the log inoculated with the spawn in each hole, we roll it on down the line here, and we're with Charlie again here at the end of the line, where he is waxing each hole. Uh, with a, it's um, something like a beeswax. Uh, you, you can use different kinds of waxes, but you want a fairly flexible wax. Do not use grafting wax, by the way. We tried that one year, and it did not work well. It's too sticky, too messy. But at any rate, so I'm going to come in close here where you can see this. So this is a, now a wax cover one. Here's one that's not yet covered. It will be as he uh, attacks that line. But the uh, we call these daubers, metal, kind of a cotton ball, and it's dipped into hot wax. Here we have this hot wax and kind of a small uh, crock pot, and just uh, do that, and it dry, it uh, kind of hardens up uh, very quickly, so it doesn't uh, roll out of there. And then we also will do the same thing on the end of the log. Um, some people don't do this. We do. Well, I'll tell you why I do. I do because Charlie taught me how to do this, and he does it. So here we are uh, going into the forest, so the big question now is after we've inoculated those logs and got those all ready to go is where do we put them? Well, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I just got to show you this special little thing. So some of you were uh, tuned in or maybe watched the recording of last week's 15 Minutes in the Forest that Jennifer Gagnon did. She talked about early spring bloomers, and the first one she talked about, anyone remember what it was? If you do, go ahead and put it in the chat, and I'll give you a hint. This is pretty late for this to still be on here. What is that? That is a red bud blossom. It's looking a little bit tired now, but I like this. One thing that Jennifer didn't say, and this is just one thing that I've kind of thought of, or actually I think someone told me, but when you look up close at that blossom, doesn't it look like a little hummingbird? taking a drink of nectar from the tree. I just think that's beautiful. And, and as Jennifer noted, they are edible. And uh, sometimes I just like to take a strip and pop them in. I've actually never had them on a salad, but uh, certainly would make it look nice and, and add some nice flavor. Okay, so here we are in the forest. And the forest really is the best place to put shiitake logs. Logs, after they've been inoculated, really need to be in a place that is damp and in the shade. Um, so it's easy to find shade you know, in a yard or even right on the on kind of the north side of the house, it, you know, right up against the house, but it's probably not going to be damp there. And so a forest works best. If you don't have a forest, you can certainly uh, use another space like that, but you may have to soak the logs to get them to bloom. Um, and the big thing is you don't want them to dry out very fast. So behind me, you can see uh, quite a a slew of shiitake logs, the two big rows on my left and my right, these were the ones that we just did this year, the ones that are left. I've sent a lot home with uh, people who have helped and with the landowner who has graciously given us uh, permission to cut the trees down on this place. And so these logs, after they've been inoculated um, and, and the wax put on the ends and covering those holes, they need to just rest for about a year. And the way that they rest is simply lying down on the forest floor. So you don't want them on a muddy spot. You don't want them in a gully where they're going to get mud and, and, and washed, you know, dirt, um, water running over them or whatever. Um, so just on a bed of leaves like you would find on the forest floor is great. Um, then after they rest, then you might want to prop them up like you see here on this tree so that they uh, have more space for the mushrooms to grow. So um, these logs that, uh, that we've done this year, many of them, depending on the size, will probably have some mushrooms this fall. Uh, they won't have any this spring, but the ones we did last year will have some this spring. And in fact, we're going to take a look and see if we can find any uh, right now. <clears throat> it's been uh, wet, but it has been cool, so we're not going to find, we may not find any. This is a big stump that, uh, that I did, uh, let's see, two years ago, I think it is. I put tags on the end of these. 
Um, so you can see the tags. These were last year's uh, logs. So I can be setting these up this year. And um, we just put the strain of the mushroom and the, the year on it. But this, by the way, is the fungus, the, the mycelium, that's growing throughout this log. And you can see kind of some evidence of where the drill the drilling holes are. Here are what the holes look like from last year. So they're kind of falling out. Here's a stem from a mushroom that was harvested. Okay. Um, I don't think we're going to find... Oh, here's some that are popping out. Look at that. All right, so these are just now popping out because of the wet weather we had the past uh, couple weeks. It's been cool, so it's taken a longer time to, to get going. But uh, we will have some mushrooms here on this log in a couple of, uh, couple of days probably, depending on the ambient air temperature. So these are some logs that were done. Uh, let's see. These are probably about three years old. You see they start falling apart. Squirrels will get into them and stuff like that. Speaking of pests with uh, shiitake logs, um, squirrels and slugs would probably be the primary pests. But generally speaking, I have not had too many problems with pests. So all right, well, that's about all I see. But it's a little early in the season. We've had good weather, but it's uh, been a little bit cool. So again, the main thing is to let some logs rest and uh, take a look at them. You know, if you forget about them, it's not a huge deal. The mushroom will grow, it'll dry out, and if you find it later on, you can still harvest that, you can rehydrate it, and make good use of it. How long will these logs last? Well, that depends on the size, but a log, oh, three or four inches, if you just let Mother Nature do the watering and the, and the fruiting, it will probably last uh, three years, three or four years. Um, if you force the bloom by soaking the whole log in, say, a kiddie pool or a bathtub or something like that, and if you do that on a regular basis, then it won't last as long. You'll get the same number of mushrooms, it'll just be in a compressed time. So that's the deal with how long these logs will last. It's kind of like they have, a, depending on the size of the log, a certain number of mushrooms that they can produce. And you can either compress it by forcing the bloom, which is what commercial growers do, but for the homeowner, the hobbyist, um, what I do and what Charlie does is we just let the rains fall when they fall, and then we kind of keep track of things and go harvest those. Which are, when you get a big harvest, it's real fun to share that with friends. All right, now we're going to go into some of the health benefits of shiitake mushrooms. So some of the major health benefits, the biggest thing people look for is the fact that they are low in calories. So when you're looking at when you're eating mushrooms, you can get about 44 calories per um, like four or five mushrooms. Uh, they're really good to boost your immune system. So like they have a lot of vitamins in them, vitamin C is one of them. Um, they reduce inflammation. They're really good in aiding for your heart. They are good at managing your blood pressure. They contain a lot of different compounds for anti-tumors, and they contain all eight essential amino acids, much like meat. So some fun facts for shiitakes. They have been used traditionally in Chinese medicine. So they'll put them in teas. They will use them fresh, mostly dehydrated when they use them in Chinese medicine. They use them mostly for their five basic tastes which creates an umami flavor, is what we call it. Um, they have, you know, they're bitter, they're sweet, they're salty and sour, depending on how you cook them. And they're best described as having like a meaty flavor. So usually when you're cooking them, no matter how, um, like that's why a lot of vegetarians use them in dishes because they taste the consistency-wise when they're cooked about the same as meat. All right, so now we're gonna go into our recipe. So today we made some good, garlicky roasted mushrooms. Um, we use fresh mushrooms, but you can also use dehydrated and rehydrate them. Uh, to rehydrate them, you would just soak them in water and they'll just plump right back up just like they were fresh. You won't even notice they were dehydrated. Uh, then we're gonna use some olive oil and some garlic and salt and pepper to taste. And then you can also alter the seasonings depending on what you're having them with. You can put Italian seasoning on there if you want a little bit more herby flavor. Um, you can make them spicy if you want. They're pretty versatile. So let's go into that recipe now. All right, so now we're going to start our shiitake mushroom recipe. So first of all, we have our mushrooms that we store in a brown paper bag. 
This way it keeps the moisture out and they don't get all yucky and slimy. So I have mine already in here, so I'm gonna take them out. And to take the stems off, you could just twist them like this. So if you get up in there and you twist a little bit, this comes right off. Or you could use your knife, get right up real close, watch your fingers, and just cut it off. If there's a little nut, that's okay. So now that we have our mushrooms cut, I like to cut them before I clean them. So then you're gonna come in here with just a damp paper towel. You're gonna wipe off the tops like so. Get all up in there if you want to. These are pretty clean already. Just gonna wipe off the tops with a damp paper towel. And then if you want to keep your cuttings, your stems, I have some already over here. So they're right over here in this. You can just keep your stems for later if you want. They're good for broths. Um, if you want to dehydrate them and use them in recipes later, then you can. All right, so now we're gonna start our recipe. So we have our bowl and our mixing spoon. Then you're gonna come in here with your mushrooms and you're just gonna slice them like about a half inch thickness. So they're gonna look like this, about four pieces per mushroom. Put them in our bowl. You can make them a little thicker if you want. You can cut them into chunks. It's a pretty versatile recipe. All right, so now these are all cut. Again, just be sure you wash your fingers. All right, so our mushrooms are in our bowl. So now we're gonna take the olive oil. We have about two to three tablespoons of olive oil. And my garlic is already chopped, but if you have to chop your garlic, you would chop about two cloves of garlic. If you want a little bit more, that's totally okay too. All right, make sure that's all in there. And then salt and pepper to taste. I like usually about a little pinch of salt and pepper. And then we're just gonna mix all that up in our bowl. I need a little bit more olive oil. And we're just gonna mix everything up. Like that. And I already have my baking sheet right here. I'm just gonna spray it with a little bit of pan before we put them on there. Like that. Then we're just gonna take our baking pan we're gonna spread them on there real nicely, make sure they're not on top of each other so they all get cooked. Like that, they're all spread on the pan. Got all those good bits of garlic on there. These are gonna roast up really nicely. So now that they're all on our pan, we're gonna put them into a preheated oven at 400 degrees for roughly 12 to 15 minutes. Mine came out really nicely at 12, and I'm gonna show you those. So here we have our roasted garlicky mushrooms. These are shiitakes again. And there you go, enjoy it. They'll go with just about anything because I'm having them with chicken. Cooking with kids is a great way to get picky eaters to try new foods. As a 4-H agent, I have seen many kids try new foods after being involved in cooking projects. I know that my three-year-old son is also much more likely to eat something if he has been involved in cooking it. Mushrooms definitely fall into a category of foods that young children are hesitant to eat. Luckily, they are also very easy for young children to chop with the right equipment. And so they are a great food to cook with a young child that you would like to coerce to eat more healthy foods. For a mushroom cooking project with a three-year-old, I recommend a nylon knife, which relieves any anxiety about cut fingers and makes for a more positive cooking experience in general. These nylon knives kind of look like toys, but they're actually pretty effective. We have even cut cabbage with them. I also recommend a stool. We have two children and so have two stools that we use for cooking projects. One has sides and is much sturdier. 
The other stool that we have is much more compact and better for smaller kitchens, but it doesn't provide as much support for very young children. We ended up making mushroom tacos with our mushrooms and both of our kids ate them willingly. Tacos in general are a great food for adding in some extra vegetables. In addition to the mushrooms, we also added bell pepper and tomatoes to our taco meat. All right, so I think um, that is the end of our presentation. So we will take any questions at this time. All right, I've got a couple questions here for Adam and I think you've already covered some of these, but if you wanna just fill in anything you've missed, more clear about it that'd be great um so adam can you tell us is this a good time of year to go ahead and collect logs and then again to inoculate them the short answer is yes this is an okay time of year the problem with collecting logs during the growing season is that they have more antifungal properties in them naturally so they need to rest before you inoculate them and then the resting i was talking about in the video Okay, so you would you could go ahead and cut them. The bark should be pretty tight now on, on all trees and, and let them um, sit somewhere for two or three weeks before inoculating them. Most people will cut the logs in the dormant season through the winter and do the inoculation before spring so that you get that soaking spring that helps uh, get things going. They can then sit through the summer and then get another soaking in the fall. So the most common time of year would be again uh, kind of winter or dormant season but it could be done now all right folks without property if i can't go in my backyard and cut down a tree where do you think i can get a log and <laughs> what about a municipal mulch collection site great question so it does need to be a green log a freshly cut log so going to a municipal mulch site is um could work but uh it, you know, a lot of different kinds of things get dumped there Trees that are removed may be dead, so you wouldn't want to collect up uh, dead stuff. But if it was uh, just cut a green tree and dumped there, then you could. You're on the right track. Connect with someone who does tree work. And when they're doing working on a, an oak tree, whether it's a red oak or a white oak tree, if you can get a few logs from them and maybe some, some mushrooms in return for that uh, favor, then that would be uh, a good idea. Okay, in the beginning of your presentation, you said that mushrooms grow by two ways, either by um, spores or by growth. Mm -hmm. And the question is, can you give an example of spreading by growth? Was that what your video was about? That's when you're stuffing the, the logs and all that stuff? Right, yeah. Okay. So you remember maybe the first picture I showed on the log with all those mushrooms. So those spread by growth. It wasn't that one grew out and dropped spores and then more grew up. So if you actually go into the woods and peel back bark off of dead trees that are on the ground or whatever, and you see a bunch of stringy stuff underneath the bark, that, uh, that is mycelium from various types of decomposing fungi. So that is by growth. What is meant by compressing logs? I think what uh, maybe was what the listener caught uh, me talking about was compressing the growth of the mushrooms by soaking the logs rather than by letting the the natural moisture of rainfall uh, stimulate that so i'm not talking about physically compressing the log just talking about compressing the flush of mushrooms by by soaking those logs or uh, versus letting them just be in the natural elements can they infect neighboring trees in the forest great question thank you for that I hate invasive species. I spend a lot of my own time on the property I live killing invasive plants. And the good news is the shiitake are not invasive. Can they infect neighboring trees? If a tree is alive, no. If a tree falls and it happens to be in close proximity, it is theoretically possible that you could get some shiitake on that. Um, the only spread I've seen is from like one log pile to another in, in a kind of a mushroom yard where there's a bunch of logs that over time have built up. So the, the practical answer to that is no. The theoretical is in theory it is possible, but I've not seen it happen. And this question might be related to the pests that you mentioned, but so mice don't like the, the mushrooms? I won't. Uh, claim to speak for all mice, but I've not had any trouble with mice on my uh, in my uh, mushroom log yard. And I've not heard uh, Charlie, the guy who was in the video with me, who's been doing it quite a long time. Um, we talk about squirrels and slugs as uh, being the pest. Quick and easy one. So you rest the wood and then inoculate, correct? Or yeah, so, rest and then inoculate. 
Yeah, well, there's kind of, I've used the word rest in two different places. So when you initially harvest a log, you want to give it some time for the natural antifungal properties to kind of dissipate so that uh, when you put the spawn in there, the tree doesn't have natural ability to fight that off. This is actually a pretty weak fungal species, uh, which is good in that it doesn't spread. Uh, the, most of the resting that I talked about when I was standing in the woods with those logs laying on the ground, those are resting for the first year on the ground before you prop them up the following year, and that's just to get more surface area. There's nothing wrong with leaving them on the ground all the time. Uh, they just won't have as much surface area for the mushrooms to grow on. Trees besides white oak, anything else we can use? Yeah, good question. Um, so oaks are the, are the best in that uh, they tend to last the longest. White oaks, uh, red oaks, and those are the two broad oak categories. So anything in those two categories that are oaks. I've got a friend in Southside Virginia who uses uh, sweet gum. That also works. It just doesn't last as long. Beech is one that works. Probably doesn't last as long either. Uh, those are softer wooded species, so they will disintegrate, kind of decompose more quickly. What you're doing is decomposing it, but you're decomposing these logs with uh, fungus of your choosing rather than what you know would naturally do that. So there are other species, and, um, and there are certain strains of mushrooms that will do better on different species as well. Oaks is kind of the go-to, but if you have some other, uh, of these others uh, handy, more handy to you, then give them a try. All right, if someone wants to sell them, can you point them to specific regulations? Specific what? Regulations for selling. Oh, oh boy, that's a good question for a farm to table venue. And no, I do not know the answer to that question. Something I can look into other than, you know, getting whatever you need to be a vendor at a local farmer's market. I don't know that there, I don't think there would be anything additional to that. I don't know. Does uh, Lena, Katie, Tiffany, do you happen to have any input on that question? I don't, but we can look into it and um, send it out to everyone that registered afterwards. One thing I didn't mention though, Katie, that that brings to mind is another option for selling besides the mushrooms is actually to sell the logs. So we do this demonstration typically once a year at a farmer's market and we sell the logs that we inoculate. And of course, I'm just doing it on a cost recovery basis, but people love to uh, try this out. And if you sell logs that have been aged one year, then they can fetch $20 a piece, which pretty good return in terms of the actual costs that go into that in, in material. Adam, were you drilling the entire log or just on one side? Yeah, thank you. That was a little bit misleading, with, especially with uh, the, that drilling demonstration, but the whole log. So it goes all the way around in that diamond-shaped pattern. And where did you buy the spawn? Or where so, came from someone? Yeah, so there's um, a large mushroom whatever you want to call it, company in Wisconsin, and uh, bought a uh, spawn from them. There's also someone in Albemarle County who sells uh, various mushroom tools and spawns and to include shiitake. So you can uh, pretty easily order it online uh, from either one of these places or by phone. Northwoods or something like that, I think is the name in Wisconsin and the one in, in Albemarle County, Virginia. Mark Jones, Sharondale Farm, that's it. Mark Jones is the proprietor of Sharondale Farms. Okay, how do you know when they're ready to harvest? Ah, uh, good question. I had a picture uh, in the earlier slide, and I might be able to get back there. But uh, so the cap, for the ideal harvest, the cap should still have a little bit of curl on the underside. When it flattens out, that's when it would start to lose value in the, you know, the gourmet and stuff like that. You wouldn't package that and sell it. I eat them like that all the time and they're just fine, but it doesn't have quite the appearance of the accepted, you know, uh, gourmet mushroom. They're ready to harvest whenever you want to eat them. I try to let mine grow as big as they will so I get a little bit more out of them. But um, if it dries up real quick and it's, it's a small, smaller mushroom, then I'll go ahead and harvest that or you can leave it and it'll, next time it rains, it'll get a little bit bigger. If you have it, uh, if you cut a tree that's log, um, larger than four foot by seven inches, can you use that for growing shiitakes? Yeah, you can use as large or as small as you want. The limitation with large, of course, is just handling it. But I do some pretty big logs. Um, I guess I'm young enough yet to handle it, <laughs> or foolish enough to to not uh, be smart about it. But um, the larger it is, of course, the longer it'll last. It does take a little bit longer to get going. 
but it'll last more years the larger it is. And will your original inoculants keep producing? Like, is it possible to keep producing from? Uh, yeah, good question. So someone who really knows what they're doing with, with mushroom um, mycology could certainly do that. I wouldn't quite know how to start with that, but these places where you buy the spawn, which that bag I had, by the way, that was uh, about half full that you saw in the video, but a, a full bag will do 20 or more logs, and that was, I think, $20. Um, so fairly, fairly cheap. But that's what they do. These, these um, manufacturers or growers of the, of the spawn will, uh, will keep it going with their various strains. How much production in pounds or ounces can you get per log? Good question. There is an answer for that. I don't remember it off the top of my head, and it does depend on the size of the log. I want to say something that I read recently as I was um, refreshing myself for this presentation. It was like uh, eight pounds for a log over the course of the life of like an average size log, you know, four feet long, uh, four inches in diameter. I, I don't have a, a specific answer for that, but it will. It is. It is a pretty defined. You know, there's a, good, a correlation between how many pounds that log is and how many pounds of, of mushrooms you'll get out of that. The one variable is that the more sapwood you have versus heartwood, which is in the middle, the more sapwood, that's where most, where you get most of your growth of the mushroom rather than the heartwood. The heartwood has natural properties that kind of resist that. It's, it's decay, more decay resistant. Adam, do you have advice for harvesting shiitakes? Do people need to look out for any toxic species that might look similar or is it pretty straightforward? Yeah, that's a good question. So if you inoculate a log with shiitake, uh, chances are that's what's going to grow on that log. I've never seen anything else grow on that. So that's the objective with your timing, which don't put more into this. You know, it's not super critical. You just, you cut a green log, you let it rest for a week or two or three, and then you, um, you know, you inoculate it and, and then you let it rest for months or a year. Um, and what you'll get off of that log is shiitake. There's not going to, once it occupies that, nothing else is going to grow there. I, I think the risk of, of uh, something that was not a shiitake is quite low, and the risk of something that would be dangerous, uh, possibly poisonous, is nearly menisc um, nearly zero. I'm not going to say zero because that's um, <laughs> no one ever says that liability-wise. But uh, from what I understand, anything that grows on wood won't kill you. It might not taste good. It might not make you uh, feel great, uh, but it won't kill you. Well, that's comforting. I'm glad to know that. <laughs> All right, so if you've got a bunch of stumps from cut over land, can you just use those? You could possibly do those. Uh, yeah, if you got to those uh, stumps as soon as the trees were cut, you know, within a couple of weeks, yes, you could do right on a stump. The problem would might be that uh, in, if it's clear cut, which is what most people mean when they say cut over, is that uh, there's not going to be a lot of shade there. So. Sure. Uh, so your, your yield might be a little bit drawn out over years rather than, I mean, many, many years, but it could, it could possibly work. Slightly off topic, um, it's about oyster mushrooms. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you can um, answer this, but if someone has cherry tree logs from a neighbor and oyster mushroom bugs, can mm -hmm. they inoculate in four weeks? I don't have personal experience with oyster mushrooms. So I don't think I can answer that question uh, with complete confidence. And I don't know about cherry. I know oysters are pretty easy to grow in, in a lot of species. They're pretty generic. So I'm guessing that cherry would work, but I don't know that for sure. And we can, we can check into that for sure. Okay, do you have specific varieties for the Blacksburg area or is it you know, the same throughout Virginia? As, as far as uh, the types of trees, species? Um, I think this is in reference, to, that's a good question. I'm not sure what's, I was okay. assuming it was in reference to the type of mushrooms for Okay. Blood. Well, I'll, I'll address both of them. In terms of types of trees, species, it's gonna be the same, no matter the region of the state or the region of the, of the world, really. And we're talking about the same genus uh, in, in all cases, which is Quercus and Oak. And in terms of uh, species of, um, or varieties of mushrooms, of, um, of shiitake, there are strains, that's the word, strains that are better suited to a hot, humid environment like 
you know, Virginia Beach area, something like that, where you have a longer hot and humid period than, than we do here where I am in the Piedmont or you would in Blacksburg. And the, the place where you would buy your, your spawn, they'll either be able to tell you that or they'll have it already detailed on their website or in their, in their catalog as far as which work is going to work better in different areas. When you're drilling, what size drill bit and how deep should the plug be? So the drill bit, it's about half an inch. It doesn't have to be that size. So if someone just wanted to try this, if they had everything, you know, if they just had some spawn, then take a drill, get a half inch bit, drill in for maybe three quarters or an inch deep, and then just push that in there. You know, you don't have to have all the gadgets. The gadgets just make it easier. Case in point, I mentioned the plugs in the, in the video, the wooden dowels. Those actually go in a different size hole, slightly smaller. So this is not all that critical, uh, but the basic idea would be about a half inch uh, diameter uh, hole, about an inch deep, and then fill that. And it should be fairly well packed in that hole. You wanna have that hole that you drill fairly full. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be packed super tight, but it should be quite firm. And then you just seal that with that wax. Uh, people also will put, um, take a, a, a clip of uh, that foam cording that people will put around a door or window for insulation and just cut a little bit of it out that fits in that hole at that size to hold that. So the wax just holds it there. The foam cording can do the same thing. But then you end up with foam cording all over the place. Kind of an ugly thing. Gotcha. All right. And I think this is the last question. Any um, advice on can they grow with a little bit of sun or do they have to be full shade all the time? Okay. Well, someone needs to come up with a question for Tiffany while I'm answering this question because I've been a real question hog here. But no, they don't need any sun. These, again, these are not plants that photosynthesize this. Uh, you could technically do this in your basement, you know, with no light at all. That's what mushrooms are. They are living off of something else. And in the case of this, they're living off of, of a piece of wood, a piece of oak. So no, no sunlight needed at all. Uh, the shade, the ideal thing about woods is that you've got shade and moisture. Both of those are present in that place. If you're doing it in your basement, you're going to need a bathtub or something like that to get, get them wet. Um, I think there's one more question from Facebook Live. Someone was wondering where they could buy an inoculated log. I don't know of a place to send you exactly. Uh, actually, Sharondale Mushroom might, uh, there in Albemarle County, they might uh, sell you a log. I don't, there, I would check farmers markets in the area. If someone grows shiitake mushrooms, they can, they might be interested in selling you a log. I don't know. The only one that I know of, but my view is fairly limited on this. I don't know everything in the whole state, but in Madison, we do this once a year, except when there's COVID-19 or some other pandemic that stops it. Thanks everyone for attending today. I will follow up with an email and we'll try to answer those, a couple of those questions that we didn't have um, specific answers to. And Adam also wanted to share some links of some resources, so I'll share those as well. Um, there are some links there about how to sign up for future programs. Um, our next session next Friday at two will be on turkeys. Um, so I hope we will see you all at some of our future sessions and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks everyone. Thank you.